Hallo? Hallo, 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 Ja, det er litt til. Hallo? 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 Hmm. Hallo? Hallo? Hallo. Hallo. Hallo? Hallo. Can you hear me? This was a bit inconvenient standing like this. So I will try to speak up loud as we are waiting for the sound technicians to give us some more volume. So yes, my name is uh, Dr. Nielsen. I have been in charge of the committee organizing this event and it is with great pleasure on behalf of the Center for Ecological and Evolutionary Synthesis, the Department of Biosciences, the Science Library and the University of Oslo to welcome you all to this conference. Uh, before we start I will deal with some practical information. Everything uh, during the conference will happen within this building. We have three auditoriums uh, just along the hall here. The poster session is in the foyer. Uh, the toilets are downstairs. In case of uh, fire, 
Nils Christian goes first. <laughs> the rest of us follow. Um, we uh, have urged you to upload your talks early, and then we had some technical problems, so if you haven't done it already, try to do it as soon as possible in uh, one of the breaks. We also really would like to see that people keep the time. We have made some nice signs like this. When you see it, you understand what happens. 15 minutes of talking, a few minutes for questions, and then people should be able to move between auditoriums, also during the parallel session. Uh, in the program, it says that there's a radio show going on tomorrow. Uh, we have had some questions what that's all about. Uh, outside in the foyer, uh, NRK P1, 2, 1, 2, uh, is broadcasting live uh, one Friday a month with uh, questions to scientists and uh, different stuff. So that has to be a live nationally broadcasted radio show going out, going on out there with participants from this audience. But now we are about to start already 10 minutes delayed, but that's okay. And we will start out with uh, two back-to-back -back, uh, keynote talks. Uh, and first out is our own Nils Christian Stenset. Nils Christian Stenset okay. is uh, a professor at the Department of Biosciences, sure. and he is uh, head of the Center for Ecological and Evolutionary Synthesis, a Norwegian center of excellence. He is perhaps uh, the most prominent Norwegian researcher in ecology and evolution, he has received several prizes for excellence in research and for communicating science, has been awarded several honorary doctorates and is elected member or fellow of a multitude of scientific societies around the world. Today, he will talk about uh, seemingly his favorite hypothesis for the last 40 years on and off, namely the Red Queen. Nils Christian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I have to do this. That's okay. Sorry about that. That's okay. That's okay. Can you hear me? Does it work? Yes. Unbelievable. Um, dear fellow ecologists, and it's also a pleasure for me to say very much welcome to you all here. I'm looking very much forward to this uh, two days, these two days. And uh, I'm very excited to see so many people here. So all of you are very, very much welcome. I'm going to talk about uh, what's um, on the screen here. And that this talk is an introductory talk to the conference. So it will be a mix of an overview of ecology and evolution and evolutionary biology. Uh, but it will be in between, there will be a little bit of fairly new stuff, uh, but very little detail. So it will be a, an overview type of talk, being an introduction to this symposium. Well, as was said, I'm professor of ecology and evolution and a chair of the hosting institution here. Uh, I'm a biologist of very broad interest. I'm an evolutionary biologist, spending time between doing ecology and evolution. The title of the talk here is on evolutionary ecology and the Red Queen. Uh, so then evolutionary biology, evolutionary ecology is a lot of interpretation of that. This is the way I'm going to sort of use it rather loosely. The Red Queen hypothesis basically says that uh, you have to evolve as fast as you possibly can in order to avoid extinction. Because all the other species are also evolving. And you have, when they are improving their adaptation to the environment, you have to improve as much yourself. Yourself. 
I'd like to say that this century is the century of biology, or rather it might be the century of biology. It is a, the foundation is in that book and the writing that was done subsequent to this publication of the book behind me, up until present. We have a very good theoretical foundation of biology. And of course, this is thanks to the book and this man. May I remind you about uh, what Charles Darwin said? Very simple idea. He was the first one to present this very simple but very important eye-opening idea of evolution through, the, through natural selection. He said that natural sele selection required three things. It required that the individuals are reproducing. It requires that there is heredity, so that the offspring resemble their parents more than they resemble a random individual in the population. And in the population that there is variation. You know this, but I'd like to remind you about this. He said that if you have individuals in a population with these three properties, then evolution may happen. And in general, evolution will happen if the environment changes. So if the environment changes, background changes in one way or another, over time, there will be changes in the composition of the individuals in the population. That was the idea. Darwin understood that there had to be a process of heredity, but he had no clue about what that was. As a matter of fact, his own idea about heredity was a mess, basically. But he understood that the, pro uh, that the process of heredity was necessary in order to, for evolution to occur. That he understood. It was Mendel that was the first one to understand that about the time that Darwin published his book. But Darwin and everybody else ignored what Mendel said. But Mendel laid the foundation for understanding heredity, one of the three important characteristics that is required of individuals in a population for evolution to occur. And we all know that in 1953, there was one paper, in, one page in Nature, one page that described the double helix. And that gave them the Nobel Prize, and that led to a whole sequence of Nobel Prizes linked to that discovery. And you have some of them here. Now, some of these people got two Nobel Prizes. And this is developed through to what we have today as genomics and sequencing. But Darwin, he was in the background most of this time, or I should say on and off. I'm coming back to that in a short while. A short while after the publication of the double helix in Nature, a very prominent person in evolutionary biology said this at a conference. May I turn to begin with a little known book of nearly 100 years ago, called The Origin of Species. That was said by Ronald Fisher, one of the architects of the modern synthesis. And people that knew Fisher, uh, it could be a sarcastic comment or it could be describing reality. Those that know him, knew him, said that this was a description of the, what was really going on. So this will be the century of biology if you are able to combine the classical biology and the modern technology-driven biology, such as represented by sequencing technology. 
May I now give you a short history or the history of the evolution of biology in a few minutes only. And started with Darwin. It really starts with Darwin. Because Darwin made biology a science. Darwin made biology a natural science where you could ask questions and test. It was Weismann that in some of our minds laid the foundation for understanding heredity. Because he was the first one to see the nucleus in a microscope. And he got the idea that that might be where the hereditary mechanism is located. You need to have this concept linked to re real things if they're really going to have an influence. It was officially in 1930, that was a modern synthesis where, which brought together genetics and the theory of natural selection, which during the turn of the century was seen as alternative views. It's very strange to think about today, but they did. Through population thinking, Fisher and another, they brought this together. They made us understand how this hereditary determined individuals changed over time through natural selection, through population thinking. It's ecology, it is a conference of ecology. Ecology was central during the modern synthesis, but not really emphasized as such. Ecology came in a little bit later. Then there was a fossil record, become better and better. They did experiments out in, or observations out in uh, nature. You could reconstruct the tree, the tree, uh, tree of life. We could understand our history. So we could describe everything that exists here. And we could notice for the first time that we, human beings, we were out on that tiny tweak. We were not the center. So this, if you combine these two things behind me, this will be the century of biology. Now I'm going to take the conceptual history of biology. I had a sequential history of biology in the previous section. Now I'm going to take the conceptual one. And it starts with people I've told you about already. Uh, this is Weismann with a microscope. This is the sequencing technology, which, when you're focusing on the individuals, trying to understand what the individuals are like, revolutionized our ability to do that. And of course, it was very in important in medicine. But it doesn't help us alone to understand evolution. If you are to understand evolution, you have to understand ecology. And I have the Norwegian lemon because that's my pet organism. I always come back to, to the lemmings. But I put the lemming together with Charles Elton, who started modern pop empirical based population biology in 1924. In a very, very short while, I'm going to tell you that story, how this come, came about. So lemmings are the picture of population biology, population dynamics. And if you understand population dynamics, you have the possibility of understanding the process of natural selection and then evolution. Which, of course, is also important for medical society. There is a lot of evolution going on inside us. There are lots of bugs inside us. But whenever evolution happens, the interaction between individuals in, in the environment, different species or what have you, w might change. So whenever evolution happens, ecology might change, hence the selective pressure might change. So it's a feedback loop. 
I said I was going to say some words about Charles Elton being the founder of modern empirical based population biology. He was an Oxford student in the 1920s, and at that time, what they did in zoology departments was anatomy. Elton and some of his student fellows, they said, we want to do something else. We want to go out in nature. We want to do ecology. They didn't use the word ecology, but we want to be out in nature. We want to study animals and plants out in nature. Huxley, he had an expedition. He had regular expedition, Oxford expeditions, to Spitsbergen, Svalbard. And in 1923, the summer of 1923, Charles Elton was on one of these expeditions. He told me this a few years. I had a fantastic uh, meeting with uh, Charles Elton a couple of years before he died. Very clear in his head. And he told this story. On the way back, the, the ship stopped for half a day or so in Tromsø, northern Norway. And Elton, being an intellectual, he went out on the street and he asked for a, the, the bookstore. And being a naturalist, he came into the bookstore, he asked for the natural history books. And he found one book that interested him, Norges Pattedyr, by Robert Collett, an early professor of this university. It was written in Norwegian, he didn't understand Norwegian, but he bled it through and it came to a page with several years listed. And he asked the guy in the shop, what is this? This is Pete Lemming years, he said. Ah, said Elton, there are some regularity here. And regularity has to be explained. I buy the book. This was in September 1923. 1924, he published his paper. That is the foundation of modern empirical-based population ecology, population biology. Much of the material in that book comes from Collett, who didn't understand what was going on, but Charles Elton did. And it changed Charles El Elton's scientific perspective. He started doing small rodent work. Why? Because they, they varied in time, from one year to another. There's something to explain. So the focus is very often around the top here, and the fancy new things. But if you are to have the center of biology, you have to have a broader view. And there has been, through history, some people that have had this broader view, and these three people listed in the back here, they got the Crawford Prize in 1999. It happened to be that it was like Darwin was in the room, smiling what was going on. <clears throat> so the core and we are at the ecology conference you have to understand the hereditary mechanism and you have to understand population biology if you don't you can never ever understand ecology so it's really the whole spectrum here you have to understand and that's very much the CES is the host of this uh, conference so this is very much uh, what, we are, what we are doing at CES uh, we were asked once to have one sentence, it's a long one, uh, describing what we are uh, doing, because uh, we were trying to explain when we were asked, uh, and it was very long statements. They didn't like that, but this is what we are doing. Really, interaction between ecology and evolution. The reciprocal interaction. We are really trying to combine these two perspectives of biology, and we're doing that in a broad spectrum of systems, biological systems. So, group of young, very talented people, so many of which are in the, in the room here. We have more postdocs by design than PhDs. By design because we think that ratio is better for everybody. It's better for the postdocs, it's better for the PhDs, they get better training. So under 75 members all together, it's a very international a group, very dynamic. We have 
reasonable amount of money. It's a great team. It's a very dynamic team. And we are working in a broad spectrum of things, theoretical and empirical work, speciation and hybridization, harvest-induced evolution, demo demography and population dynamics, various systems, bacterial, broad and red green. That I'm coming back to. If you really want to read more, go into the web and you can find these annual reports. This is one of them. Back to biology, ecology, what I started with. You know this, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. This is less well known. Very little in evolution makes sense except in the light of population ecology. And that was what Fisher did. He brought these two perspectives together this way of thinking together. Being at the ecology conference, this latter is very, very important. It's very important in biology. Back to this uh, same slide. That is a very, very important book in the evolution of thinking in evolutionary biology. Genomics is believed to solve everything. It doesn't, but it is very important. But this is a statement we, we have to have in the back of our head. Not much in molecular life science or genomics makes sense except in the light of ecology and evolution, which was said by Earth a few years ago. My dear friends, we have to bring ecology back into evolutionary thinking. And that's what I'm going to talk a little bit about now. There are a couple of people, besides Darwin, that have played an important role, Fisher, and the many people at the time. There are various people who have different key actors here. I think Fisher was one of the most important, one of the most important. This guy uh, had a very important role in, in many respects. He was a natural historian. John was a natural historian. He was a gardener. And he was wondering when he was taking, weeding the plants, what was happening the next year. And he was a bird watcher. He had natural history questions in his mind. And Lee Van Weyden, being an ecologist, but being paid as a paleontologist. And these three or four people are going to be, have been very important to me, are very important to me, and are very important to evolutionary biology. It says in the program that I'm going to talk about the Red Queen and um, Dr. Nielsen, uh, which is usually called Anders. <laughs> um, he said that I've been on and off thinking about the Red Queen's hypothesis of, Red, of uh, Lee Van Weyden. Originally published in 1973. <clears throat> this paper was mimeographed in a, a journal edited by him. And it all started, I have to give this small parenthesis here. That paper was uh, submitted to theoret theoretical, uh, Journal of Theoretical Biology. And John Maynard Smith was uh, editing that paper. And um, it was accepted. There was a few rounds, but it was accepted in the end. And uh, John Maynard Smith, he wrote to the copy editor or to the publisher, for God's sake, don't ask this man for a paid charge, which I did, academic press, which I did. And um, Lee Van Weyden, he objected to that. He started his own journal and he wrote a small commentary in Nature about how screwy science was developing. But that's a very important paper in evolutionary biology. Not many people are referring to it today. Many more people should have. 
the Red Queen is New Carol's, from the New Carol's to the looking glasses. And she says to Alice, now here, you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. Lee Van Weyden, <coughs> he, he was an empiricist, really. Very much an empiricist. So he looked at survival curves, really demo demography thinking. So he looked at the survival curves for various species, and it struck him that, that it was some constancy. It was a straight line on a log scale. So he asked the question, how can it be that extinction occurs random with respect to age? That is, that the rate of survival is constant, but non-randomly with respect to ecology. And his interpretation of this observation, you see in the back here, is that the probability of extinction of a taxon is independent of age. It becomes neither more extinct resistant or vulnerable over time. That is a law called now the law of constant extinction. And his assumption was that the major part of a species environment is other species, that is ecology. You're at an ecology conference. And the amount of resources in the community is approximately constant. And his conclusion was that evolutionary advantage gained by one species will cause evolutionary disadvantages to other species. So they must constantly evolve. And that led to the Red Queen hypothesis. Now you have to run as fast as you can to be in the same place. That is, species has to evolve continu continuously in order to hang around. That was one of his very, very important contributions to evolutionary biology. And what you see in the figure here is really then later being called uh, Lee Van Weyden's law of constant extinction. Repeats what I said, but in a summarizing way. The Red Queen hypothesis was groundbreaking in that it explicitly linked ecology together with evolution. And it invoked microevolutionary processes to explain macroevolutionary patterns. And some of us found very enlightening. But some people have a different way of thinking here, and this is a quote. As a matter of fact, one of those has been a collaborator now. The first one still hates us, at least me. <coughs> the Red Queen is dead, but long live the Red Queen. The core question of Lee Van Weyden remains to be answered. And the main question is really, will evolution continue indefinitely, even in an unchanging physical environment? Or will it slow down? There's a publication by John Maynard Smith, but John, a few years earlier, at a big evolution conference in Vancouver, was a few hundred people, I think 500 or so, in the audience. And John gave a talk on ecology and evolution. And he asked a question to the audience, a few hundred people out there. He asked a question to the audience, who thinks that evolution will cease if there is no abiotic variation in the environment, no physical variation? How many thinks? Half of the audience raised their hand. How many think it will continue? Half of the audience raised their hand. And he said, I think we have a evolution, I think we have a scientific problem. You guys are clever, smart, having contributed profoundly to the field. But this simple question, you profoundly disagree, disagree on. 
<coughs> but of course, I have to say that um, if, you ask, if you ask the question, what will happen if the, there's no physical variation, it doesn't mean that I think that physical variation is not important. Of course it is. But many people are, in my mind, overemphasizing the importance, and paleontologists has a tendency to do that. Not only that. But I have a tendency to focus on the big events, big perturbations. But our observations clearly demonstrating that abiotic changes is important. for evolution. And I happen to, with some good friends and students, postdocs, been involved in studies like that, linking speciation with climatic changes through history. I wanted to show this paper uh, simply to show that I actually have been focusing on that as well. Let's now ignore climatic variation for a while. And look at this broad-sensed red queen hypothesis. That evolution may continue, really, asking, this is a question, will evolution, may evolution continue forever in an unchanging environment? I sort of made a conclusion bef before you. Or ask the question, are biological interaction alone sufficient to drive long-term evolution? The question of whether evolution will continue indefinitely in a constant physical environment is a fundamental one in evolutionary biology. And it remains, to a large extent, an answer. Although I think some of the work we have done uh, have contributed to this to an understanding of this. Theories on evolutionary dynamics on macroevolution in a time scale must be formulated with sufficient pre precision so that they can be tested against what we know about ecology and the process occurring here and now. That's ambition, at least. And the Red Queen hypothesis is a platform to ask that kind of question. I've been involved in that, as uh, Dr. Nielsen said. Um, I've been involved with John Maynard Smith. It really all started by, well, it started basically in this room, actually. Um, during my, uh, pre my, my um, given topic lecture for the doctoral thesis. Uh, I was asked to, to talk about um, on extinction, a past, but I wrote a review paper afterwards, and then I understood that when I presented that talk, neither I nor the committee understood anything about <laughs> what I talked about, neither me nor them, because there was much wrong thing said at that lecture. <laughs> but uh, the publication that came out of that uh, Hopefully, it's a little bit better. Um, John Maynard Smith had written a few years, early, few years earlier a paper on the Red Queen hypothesis. Uh, and um, I sent a Christmas card to John Maynard Smith in form of a manuscript. And I said, uh, Dear John, I too am thinking about the Red Queen. See page 40, table 3. And that started a uh, Interaction by letter. This is in the let time of letters that resulted in a paper that we did in evolution. I'm not going to go into detail here, but the answer to the question will evolution cease in a st abiotic stable environment? The answer is no, it won't cease or it may cease. <laughs> That's rather helpful, isn't it? But it will stop given some condition on the parameters. And it will continue given 
other condition on the parameters. So it was an important finding, we think. It was an important finding, we think, that this kind of ecological interaction between organisms in a stable environment could lead to either stasis or continued evolution. It depends on the parameter that is. It depends on the ecology. The problem with that paper was that the conditions, mathematical condition, was not inter interpretable biologically. That's a bit of a problem. But that was an important conclusion, I think. There's been many papers thereafter, some of them here. And you see some of them I've been involved in. There's been many more also. There's been much focus on the interaction between species when it comes to pairwise interaction, host parasite and the like. <coughs> but there are many shortcomings in the, in the literature. I'm listing some of them here in the back on the screen here. I mean, in short, they are not bringing in a sufficient understanding, by and large, of ecology. I'm circling around one here, fairly recent one by, um, by, by uh, Jan Noerbotten and myself. It started by me listening to a lecture on expansion and contraction of oil reservoir that uh, Jan gave. And I was the president of the Norwegian Academy of Science and Letters, and as the president of the Norwegian Science and Letters, I had to sit and listen to many talks I didn't really understand. This was one of them. I had no idea what he was talking about, really. I didn't understand. But I saw that his equations were the kind of equation I needed for bringing population biology thinking into ecology. So during his talk, I sent an email to him. I said, Jan, I'd like to talk to you. This was a talk on, 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 on uh, oil reservoirs, expansion. I'd like to talk to you about uh, evolution afterwards. And we did on this paper. And the, and the conclusion of that paper is if only symmetric interactions, if there are only symmetric ecological interactions, there will be stasis. If there are asymmetric ecological interactions, there may be red-green type of continued evolution. And the more asymmetry there is in the ecology, the more likely continued evolution, red green type of evolution, will be. This is really contrasting these two things. And asymmetry, you get this, more likely. Symmetry, you get that. And that is ecology. That is ecology. And there are lots of when I very first realized this, I remember a paper by, by uh, uh, Tom Fenkel and others. And I had the feeling that it was log scale and it was log scale. So it's asymmetry. And lots of observations on that. And of course, that fits in with the observation that pathogen host system has been so much studied in a red queen context because they are really asymmetric. How do we move on? We have, to, we have to study the fossil record. And I'm happy to say that some of work like that is being done at CES. We should do work on isodes on bacterial communities with more than a couple of species. We are doing work there, but that's very difficult. So red green isn't dead. But there are some paleontologists presenting other views. And other hypothesis, court gestured, is an unpredictable character that has no state. Randomness, random abiotic perturbation. It's seen as an alternative. And indeed it is an alternative to the Red Queen ecology interaction. The interaction with the environment, the abiotic environment, and the in interaction between individual individuals within a species or between species. 
Tony Barnowski, uh, he had a paper in 2001, really presenting this view. I don't really like this view, but it's an alternative. There is an alternative that we can use for asking very precise question, because the Red Queen, will evolution continue in an unchanging physical environment? Yes, or maybe according to the Red Queen, no, according to the court jester. There's two alternatives here. Okay, if you have a bacterial community and we can control the physical environment, then we can actually answer that question, because it's very clear Differences here, given asymmetry and all this kind of stuff. You have to think when you do that. Because if you stop the perturbation, then according to the one view, the paleonto paleontology biased view, it will cease. And according to the ecology, and if it's loss of asymmetry, then it will continue. So there's a Dichotomy in the literature, some think that the ecology perspective, Red Queen, is the small scale, short time scale, and the paleontology view is the large scale, long term. So they do really have different regions, some think. Of course, that's not, well, they think that, you know, we think this is a applicable to everything, they think it's applicable to but it's really a mix. And the interesting question is to how much is the abiotic and how much on a relative scale is the biotic interaction de determining, contributing to the absurd pattern. A few conclusions to the end. Conclusions of sort of different kinds. There's a great deal of fragmentation within the scientific community. Ecologists focus on the study of adaptation to local condition. Paleontologists focus on the study of speciation. There's an overlap here, of course. But to a large extent, the, the study system and the time scale determine our thinking, which is wrong, bad. <laughs> some things that they are governed by different process, some things they must be some combination. And the Red Queen perspective provides such a combined view. And if you are to understand, my, in my mind, if you are to understand the effect of environmental change, climate variation, on the short and long-term perspective, we need to understand the inherent dynamics of the biotic system in the absence of such variation. Ladies and gentlemen, we have to counteract the fragmentation within biology. Or... Pursuing interdisciplinary whenever it is required by the questions asked. Science, including biology, is very much like this. We are these very sub-disciplines, studying small bits and pieces. And, and good science is always small, nitty-gritty things. It's always this. Good science is small, nitty-gritty things. But you have to have larger perspectives. And this, of course, you understand that this might not be. And the scientific community is really behaving like this. We are living in each of our trenches. We are reading different journals. We are reading different books. We are going to different conferences, etc., etc. We are never really reading each other and listening to each other's perspective. We need to br bridge the gap between these disciplines. And here I'm talking about ecology and evolution. We need to bridge the gap. Because in reality, you have to understand 
both ecology and evolution, how it changed through time. Here's an example of something else I'm thinking about. Pathogens and like. We really have to involve a lot of different disciplines. We have to come together and work together across disciplines, if you are really to understand. So we have to join forces in what I call a unified biology. We have to combine these perspectives. And we have to bring ecology and evolution together. Thank you very much.